Charlene came to the United States from Taiwan in pursuit of the American dream. One story that was particularly compelling was when Charlene was at a startup pitch competition in college and then criticized for her English language skills. I imagine Charlene as a student, trying her absolute hardest and having to overcome barriers and stereotypes people were placing on her. Fast forward a few years, and Charlene has done more than enough to prove her critics wrong. Hope you enjoy this episode. And we are very, very excited to be sponsored by the Making Lemonade Fund, Gen Z's fastest growing fundraiser, supporting COVID-19 relief, pediatric cancer, and a bunch of other great causes. Get behind them over at makinglemonadefund.com and sponsor made by our very own Jesse K. Welcome, Charlene Wong, to the podcast today, uh, the Ben and Tony podcast. And so for those of you in the audience, Charlene moved to the U.S. at a young age for college, has some great stories behind that. Then she eventually became a product manager at Google. While she was at Google, she founded her own company. And then later on in life, she founded Living OS, which is a coaching platform. And now she spends almost all of her time uh, focusing on being an executive coach, mentoring, coaching people who are startup founders, achieve their goals personally, professionally. And she's also in the process of launching a book coming out in April of 2021 called Model Breakers. So we're gonna talk about all the different stuff and all the big moments of transition in Charlene's life. So welcome, Charlene, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Tony. Thanks for having me, Ben. Uh, We're super excited to have you on. Great, so I'm thinking, Charlene, like you've had a very interesting life. Should we start with what seems to be the biggest initial transition in your life when you were younger, applying to colleges from the US? Could you explain to us like what's the story behind that? Yeah, so I grew up in Taipei, went to a local school, which means that I haven't had an English teacher before 18. Like, no one taught me how to write or speak or anything. I just, like, read the books. Zero English. Zero English. Zero English. Like, I I, I read English books, and I tried to write by mimicking the style, but I, and I kind of learned from not two friends, so I don't know if that counts as teaching, but that's the knowledge I have. So, yeah. English by watching friends. Yeah, there, there wasn't a YouTube, YouTube wasn't that popular yet. So France is my, my main inspiration. And I, I, I was going to go to like college in Hong Kong because like that's the closest global place from Taipei and my mom is from Hong Kong. And then around my sophomore summer, actually we only have two years of high school. So sophomore is like junior year of the United States. But in the second to last year of high school, I wanted to try it out, like try out how American school is like. So my mom sent me to a summer camp because like that's just going to be one summer. It's going to be fun. I came here and I was culture shocked. I couldn't really speak. So I was really introverted. And it's, it's ironic because like I'm actually an extrovert, but I have to play introvert to explain why I'm so quiet. So I've been playing that to all my classmates at the time. I just like don't want to speak. And that kind of play in the stereotype, right? Like Asian are quiet, you don't speak up. So there's that. And then six months later, I grew a lot, like from not knowing how to write proper English to like having something to publish every day because there's a writing class I took and that requires that. And then I also took another debate class, which means that you have to speak about issues like gun control, like things I have no knowledge about. And after that six months, I just saw how much I grew. And I told my mom that I want to come here for college. And she's like, you're crazy. Like, you know how much it costs? Like, you know, do you know how to apply even? And, and people prepare that for their whole life. Like, when are you actually going to start? And I only have one year left, right? So I spent the first six months just arguing with them and telling them why this is a good choice. And the only evidence I had is that if I could grow so much in six weeks, I feel like four years can change my life. Yeah. I don't have any other, like, evidence or proof. But then they're like, well, that's kind of weak. You know, like, that's only six weeks. And what are you trying to tell me? And I was like, I don't know, like, this is just an experiment. Like, if we could, I will, like, I will apply for financial, I will apply for anything I could. And I, if I get into a good school, let me come. And then I, I went to Brown eventually, but they, I don't think they know what Brown is, even though they heard of the Ivy. So, so they were like, okay, let's try. And I spent three months, took all the tests and apply, like, apply for a college. The essays are probably pretty bad. And, and then there is a college exam in Taipei. That college exam determines where you go for college. Uh, I, I register as my parents advice, but I didn't go. So, cause I know that if I have an exit choice, like if I have an option in Taipei, I will have to stay there. That's my, that's my thought. So I just 
kind of skip the exam. <laughs> so it's either Pretty no sure. college or somewhere in the US, right? And then they have to choose, do I want to have college or not? And, and, and what, sorry, what, yeah. what, do you, what, was, what about the US you think changed you? I mean, it sounds like, you know, you grew up in Taipei your whole life. Um, and it, I, I didn't hear you mention at all before then any sort of desire to be in the US. Maybe you, you're obviously watching Friends, big part of life. But you, you <laughs> went to, to school, this like summer program, and it seems like that really did change your life. What, what was it? Was it just the fact that it was a new culture? Did you find something about America interesting? Because I'm just curious, like, it seems like you've, you changed yeah, your entire think, direction. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I also did a college tour. And since uh, I was at FLS Academy in Dover, which is like in around Yale, Harvard, MIT, and Brown. So I toured all of them. And I heard like what college is like, which is really different from what they offered. offered. Like you don't have to pick your major, like yeah. you can have this liberal arts education, which I still, I, I know I have an idea, but I didn't have an idea of like what that is. Uh, mm. And then there's all these kind of support and advice that we just, I just never heard. And I was like, wow, like they invest so much in you. Yeah. And yeah. I want to be like that. So I just had that, maybe they have good marketing. So <laughs> I was bought it. Americans do. Americans are definitely yeah. good marketing. Definitely. <laughs> I was sold so, uh, on their marketing. And I was like, oh, this is such a wonderful place. And there's definitely that American dream, which I read from books and maybe from friends or some other cultural entertainment. So uh, yeah, there's that. And that's how I want to become an ambassador for America and tell my mom that, hey, you should invest in me to go there. <laughs> I love it. And what, what was it that was kind of, scaring your parents about you making that transition? I haven't left home. Like I have always been staying with them. I rarely do chores. So they're like, you're going out there surviving. Like, can you actually survive? Like not learning the English, learning the, the life skills that they never taught me. <laughs> well, um, and, and while learning, cause they feel like college is like this important four years where you're going to uh, learn a bunch of different things and make important friends, right? So they, they have never studied abroad, so maybe there is that. And they also went on a very traditional, uh, they are both doctors and then it's like nine years, they marry and then like become doctors. So it's a pretty scheduled path. Mm -hmm. And they have no idea what to, what to expect if I, came, if, if I go to US at that point. And, and when you ended up going to Brown, like, well, two, two questions, like, did you have like a career plan in mind? Because I mean, I would imagine with two doctor parents, Perhaps they're like pushing you in a certain direction professionally, maybe not. And the second question is like, what was, what was college like? Because there's a difference between, you know, actually being in a four-year college, diving really deep into American culture and university culture versus that summer program. So did you, what happened when you actually got there? My parents are unconventional, I think. Okay. My, my dad is really busy. And my mom, she, they, well, they both value education, but my mom only had this like three things that I need to do. One is get good at English because that seems to be important. Second is uh, get good at math because you want to understand how things work. And number three is no computer science because like she read a newspaper that said this is important. And I think That's I was smart. at 12 and she said, just focus on these three things and you'll be good in life. So she didn't tell me what to do for a job, but she actually did. She also read the newspaper and saw, oh, she saw product management when I was in like high school. And she's like, hey, this seems really like what you like to do maybe this will be a good fit for you. And it turns out to be. So, so I feel like she just like have some sources and she has her own mental model and she checked and she felt like mm, intuitively, this is great. So that's all the advice she gave. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And, and I, I, so when you came over here, I guess, you know, you mentioned that you'd gone from being, you were, you're actually an extrovert, but you're behaving as an introvert and, you know, being slightly shy, um, presumably, considering, you know, what you're doing now, you started to blossom and started to come out of your shell. Like, what was that process like? And was that during college? Yeah, so the college, I think, is a turning point, but it came with a big headwind. So first year in college, I was really, I majored in computer science, applied math economics. And I would say computer science is the main one, where I actually get to view stuff, like, you know, go to those hackathons and have a startup, startup to, to launch. And in my freshman year, there was this like a uh, general generous office hour by the Entrepreneur Center. So I went there, pitched the idea to an alumni, and the alumni just said, "Well, he's like super super enthusiastic about the previous one." So I'm like, "This is going to be a good one." And then I get, and he just looked at me, and I, I introduced myself. I haven't even said the startup's name. He's like, "Hey, like you know, go back, practice your English because you have to speak to pitch, right? Like kind of like." And he lectured me for 15 minutes while I'm wasting his time. 
and really? I just felt really ashamed. I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm a freshman jumping and interrupting this important person's time. And then I, I should, I should uh, apologize for that. Wow. And I didn't tell that incident to anyone, not even my mom, not even my co-founder, because I just felt really ashamed that I have to get better at that. And that has been the main motivation for me to like learn this language well, <laughs> and also to, to kind of like prove myself. And what really happened is that a year, a year after that, I think roughly a year or a year and a half, um, I was invited to another, I would say startup pitching event where I'm helping founders to pitch their idea to like fix, fix their business model and do things like that. And then it's also run by another alumni who is really generous, uh, angel investor, has sold company to Facebook and Google. And we were at a dinner where he's like hosting people who are like coaching their founders. I got there and I introduced myself. This time I got to finish my introduction by telling the things I have done in the startups. And then he just said, uh, he has, he's, this, is, this time it's really implicit. Like he didn't call out anything, but I can tell that he doesn't, he doesn't trust that I have the skills to help, help those people. But he's also really nice to not point it out, but I can just tell from his facial expression. And then I don't know why, I think it's all like some gut feel, but I feel like I have to, correct him this time otherwise I'll be walk over again so I just mm. say hey I think you ha you're holding back here uh, I saw your hesitation and okay. I want to address that yeah. so I just call him out up front and tell him why I think I deserve to be here and this is my story uh he I don't think he bought it at the moment but he just like let it be <laughs> uh and after that uh yeah yeah, no, that's just an amazing thing to do, right? I mean, that takes a lot of courage to step up to someone who, you know, maybe potentially is doubting you to at least get them to talk a little bit more about the reasons why they're potentially doubting you. Yeah, I, I didn't think too much about that. But I think now if I have to, like, give a reason, I think it's because there is that, like, deja vu where like, oh, something's happening again. And then yeah. I have this feeling that I have to speak out because I didn't. And if I don't, I will be, like, this will just keep repeating in my life. And I don't want that to happen. So, and there's also no downside. Like I only saw him at this things. There's no, like, like he, I wouldn't see him afterwards if I don't want to, so I can just do whatever I want. So uh, no downside. And I just like tell him like, hey, I think this is what's happening here. After that book camp, uh, a, lot of, a lot of founders wrote email to him to thank he, him for inviting me. And he was just surprised. Cause like, I think I am around 10 years younger than most people in the room. And he's like, what, what did you do? Like, why, why are people, like, what did they get out of this? And then I, I tell him like what I did and he's pretty surprised. And he actually did something that I didn't expect. He apologized. He apologized over Messenger, which I still keep the screenshot. And he said, uh, thanks, thanking me for calling him out and giving him the chance to, to know what I could offer. And then if I were to raise any like foundings in the future, he will be the first check in, which he actually did. So oh. I was just really amazed that a, I have this opportunity to like rewrite my history and also there is someone who is willing to learn at the moment by, by a person who is like a lot younger than he, he is. That, yeah. that, that's, that's, that's such an incredible experience. Yeah, that's, that sounds like such an impactful moment. Like I, I can imagine like what you must have been like 20 years old at the time or something. And, and I yeah. just remember, you know, like all the sensitivities that we're feeling at that time period and being in college and having someone in such a position of like power treat you in a certain way and then not just that but the fact that you really stood up for yourself like that that seems like it's so admirable honestly and, and it also like reminds you that that like I think the biggest lessons come from sometimes like pain right it's like it was it was mm -hmm. the pain that you felt that first time that made you realize that you're saying I'm not letting this happen again and and what was yeah. what's amazing to me is because I thought you're going to end up saying something like so then he got really angry at me and then you know like we I broke that relationship <laughs> whatever I did that the right thing. That would be another good story. <laughs> yeah which would also be a good story, but it's even better it's like you kind of won over this person and that's like it shows like the outcome of you standing up for yourself isn't that you're gonna piss someone off the outcome can sometimes be that like the right thing does happen in the end. Yeah, yeah. and I think the other thing, the other thing I, just to add to that as well is you know we, we had um, uh, an illustrator called Dapo Adiola on and he spoke about how one professor's belief in him in his early college days has, you know, stemmed with him for the last 20 years and helped him become who he is today. So it's just amazing kind of the, the effects of just one person believing in you in this kind of way can be. It's all it takes. Because yeah. I think sometimes we, sometimes we lost the trust because there's people telling us otherwise, right? And it just takes one person to undo that. 
but it's yeah. rare to meet that one person who has the power to convince you otherwise. Yeah, I, I'm starting to also see the parallels here between obviously what you ended up doing well, however many years later with, with coaching and wh where that comes from. But maybe before before that, uh, maybe like obviously. So, OK, I, uh, after graduating from college, it was then the fact that the next big thing that you went through was working at Google. Is that right? And or you started a company I'm trying to remember exactly. Yeah, so uh, Living OS and APM was started around the same time frame. I, I would say Living OS first because there's like a gap before I graduate and then uh, working full time. And the, the way I started Living OS is just, to buy, is just to write every day. I didn't know what I would do next, but I know that I'm not happy just having like a good job. You know, like I feel like I'm not, my creativity wasn't expressed anywhere. Yeah. And yeah. I wasn't that eloquent at the time. I wasn't like a good writer. Like I actually almost, <laughs> <laughs> almost failed my writing class in college so I think there's yeah. there's that and then I, I, I don't know why there's one day I was just like thinking I was like hey if I could improve my writing maybe I could find I, that could help my job that could help my like coaching that could help everything so I decided to write every day and this is this is while I, you're at Google sorry you you already had a full-time job uh, that's at like right before so before, there's like oh, sorry. time between like yeah, yeah. and then I, I started writing but I didn't know what to expect, right? I just started to answer people's questions around like relationship and life, like pretty random, like pretty general. And then one thing that kept like, com I, I got the most reply when I talk about personal growth, personal growth from like confidence, from like, how do you deal with like difficult conversation? How do you fire people, hire people, those kind of stuff. And, and then it came to me that, Hey, I probably couldn't write about like product management because like conflict of interest at work. So I decided to focus on personal growth. And then that sort of took off because like that personal growth focus helped me find my interest in like just helping people like me and also doubling down my coaching skills. So, the, the, okay. So I started coaching before the writing, but I really scaled the coaching after the writing because like writing gave me the audience to, to surf well on the surf. Yeah. How, how does one get into coaching? Because I feel like I, I personally know a lot of coaches, but I just, to me, it doesn't seem like an obvious path to know you should become a coach right like yeah you know how did that come about so i think i saw three typical paths the first one is the easiest one which you go to take a class you get certification and then you become a coach right so there's like those icf or things like that i think those are fine but those are not the coach i want i, I want to become like i want to be a, a really special coach that has like that can solve, solve problems in a really short amount of time and give value to, to help founders to achieve more and then there's a second type of coach who, who were founders. Like they just basically coach what they have uh, been through and then they help the other person do the same. And then there's a third type, which is like what I did is apprenticeship. Um, I had a coach before I become a coach. And that coach is who uh, helped me like step-by-step step to know how to help people uh, by testing him on their clients and just growing me in the first, I think six months. So that's how I got started. And I know a few other folks who did that, which I think is actually the most efficient path because you are learning by doing and you have yeah. someone overseeing you, making sure you're not making a big mess with people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is important. Yeah, which is important because like life, you know. So, and, and I think, but apprenticeship is hard to find because like you have to find someone who is willing to invest in you and you're willing to like, you know, follow them around for a while. So there is that trust that needs to be built. Yeah. But, uh, but you said, you said, you, you know, you were writing for what, how many days were you, you were writing every single day for how many days? Yeah. Writing for every single, I think I ended up writing for closer to 250, 60 days. And did I ended up adding the creating component? I, I ended up like not only writing, but like, like recording podcasts, taking out interviews. Cause I feel like there is more weight than like, I feel like writing, I am not able to like write, what, write whatever I think. And I want to challenge myself by other, challenging other medias. That's, I mean. Clearly, this is the kind of stuff Ben and I are really into. Um, like, <laughs> what? what uh, so how, how do you build yeah. up that writing habit? How do you stick at something for two hundred and fifty days? Yeah. So I I can send you the articles before, but I think the key really is to be curious about life. So unlike most writers, I don't have a schedule. I like I don't I don't know what I'm writing every day. I just try to enjoy my life until like five p.m. And then I basically do my meditation twice a day. And in the afternoon of meditation, I would just write whatever came up. I usually have a 30 plus draft in queue. So there is something I can fall back to if there's nothing really, really exciting. 
I always have. So I haven't been using that draft, which has been like going up to like 50 or 60 queues, uh, 60 drafts in the queue. And I think I'm right about, I think things either, I have, I, I always have coaching. I always have a coach. So coaching session learning is a big one. Um, I serve people as well. So there is that. And then also like the way I run the nonprofit, the, the way I run Living LS, right? Cause I, I think I actually had the team really early, uh, three months in. So how do I run a re remote team and making sure the incentive is aligned? That's a really big stuff. So I just write about anything I'm learning. Like you can call that learning public, but, or any challenge I'm facing. And, and how would you like, okay. So I think all of us on this podcast are, are we, we're all writers in some way. We're all podcasters now. And I think we all see the value, both when it comes to like a business perspective, personal reflection of writing, like for someone that might not necessarily be like, for my, that, that sounds intimidating. Like if you're someone, someone who's listening right now and they're like, holy shit, 200 days of writing, like that sounds like a lot. Oh my God, I'm too intimidated. What would you say to a person like that about the value and the benefits it's given you? So before writing, I really don't know where I'm going to get my next like 10, 20 coaching clients. Because like, for me, I really value like recommendation and fit. And that audience selection is the, is the bottleneck, right? But then when I started to write, I was able to find people who write alike or read alike. Write alike meaning that I can collaborate with them and then we can uh, help each other grow our audience. Read alike meaning that I can have a deep, meaningful conversation over email usually to learn about their life, even though we have never met. Like someone in, like me talking to you, like <laughs> as an average uh, example, right? So there's that connection, that, that serendipity that writing brings you. And that's free. And you couldn't, you couldn't engineer that. I mean, you could by like writing, like calling, an act, calling for an action or like writing something that uh, is trending. But that relationship building, that connection, I think is really the key writing brought me. I love that. I absolutely love that. And, and one thing, I mean, that I've definitely experienced through my writing is it just helps me get a lot more clarity in my thinking. Yeah. Uh, I think it's so easy to speak about your opinions without actually having the, taking the time to challenge them, to get them down on the page. And I think one thing that I found really interesting, and I'd be super interested to know if you found the same, is that when you're writing about something that you think you knew about, often you kind of get to the middle of, of your article or whatever you're writing about, and you're like, wait, hang on. I'm gonna need like at least another week of writing, redrafting, iterating, because actually I don't know the substance of what I want to say. Um, and I think it's very easy to kind of spew it out vocally verbally um and i think you know i've got a lot more clarity when i'm when i'm writing that's why i have 30 plus drafts because i don't know where they're <laughs> going you know i just started to write and i think there are two ways out one is that you can just switch on audio like turn on author start talking as if you're talking to a friend and look at the transcription to see what pattern came up usually uh, a question maybe a well-crafted question that is great to follow up or there's something you need to do more research on another thing that i actually learned from writing my book is having kind of like chapter templates, uh, writing templates, right? Pick the authors you really admire, hopefully people who write on a regular cadence and try to do an x-ray about how they write. Do they usually start with a hook, go into research, do support, like try to find those templates. And then if you could like maybe find your top three favorite newsletter writer, see how they write and then use that structure and follow that structure, you are going to get a lot of clarity because you know that you're going into a supporting sentence or a, a, a research in the next paragraph and you will try to have that content ready. So that's the two ways out for writer's block. If that is. <laughs> that's actually really helpful. Like I was, I'm just thinking about that. Like I, I, those are tactics that I haven't really used in my writing, but I feel like uh, I'm going to actually use that like later today when I do some writing. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Is there stuff that you're following? <laughs> is there stuff that you're following now, apart from obviously Ben and I's newsletter that you're like really loving in terms of like writing, like, uh, or I mean, I mean, because like I just think I just love to know from like your creative inspiration and sort of like professional inspiration. Are there certain articles or author or even like maybe books and stuff that that have kind of inspired you over the last year? Because again, I'm just so like impressed by the 200 days of writing that I feel like you sh you. You're very credibly like a writer. And I just love to know where like some of the inspiration comes from these days. I love reading footnotes. This may be weird. Footnotes? But I usually, really? Yeah. I, I start reading a book by reading their footnotes. And the best footnote writer is Malcolm Gladwell. If you go to his book, uh, say Talking to Strangers, see the footnotes. Like that's not just a foot, it's not just citation. He will he will literally write about how he started the book, how like how he got a conversation going, like how those things came into being. 
I think people usually don't read the footnotes, which I think is a big miss, but I usually, sometimes I just read the footnotes and that's all I need because I just want to know how they write. So, uh, so for a book, I think Malcolm Gladwell is the canonical example for research. Adam Grant is really good at structuring his chapter. Also a lot of research, a lot of like conversation, but I think the way he structured and make a, making a good, because like writing a book is make, basically selling a big idea, right? He's really good at packaging stuff into a big idea to let people understand. So there's that book model as well. In terms of inspiration, now I read really differently. Yes, I only read Funnel sometimes, but I also read by, I also treat book as a journal. So when I read, I don't really, sometimes I don't really care what they're saying. I just want to know what inspiration does that bring me. Like if I was reading like say Jerry's Reboot, uh, a really good book for founders, especially executives that running companies, um, he's also uh, a, a, an exec coach in, in, the, in the Bay Area. And I just read the book and see, okay, so he talks about how to develop personal integrity. How, to, how does that manifest in my life? I just like to journal on the side. So if you look at the books I read, you will see a bunch of journaling <laughs> and a bunch of ideas that kind of pop up. Because I think reading to me is more like conversation with the authors. I'm trying to understand how the authors think. And so when I were really to have a chance to talk to them, I, 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 they're like my old friend. So that's my way of reading. Hey, I love that. Yeah. I feel like you similarly about, I'm, I'm an avid reader of the FT. Um, it's basically one of my only uh, uh, sources that I read from. And there's some of the journalists there where I, I, I just kind of run through all of their comment section, trying to find yeah. someone who's arguing with them in the way that I would want to argue with them, see what they have to say about that. Um, <laughs> I absolutely love that. That's an awesome but idea. Yeah, that breadcrumb is the best. And, and Char Charlene, so like right now, um, can you explain to us how like Living OS came about? Because Living OS is also a, a newsletter, but it's also like, it's, it, there's a fellowship involved. There's like a nonprofit angle. So if we could like maybe go back to when you decided to get into coaching, like what, and also like, wh what does Living OS mean? Like, where does that name come yeah. from? So, so that, all that stuff, the like culmination of all this that you put together, what, like, can you tell us about the foundation of Living OS? Yeah, so Living OS, my friend gave me that name. It's basically an operating system for life. Because I am a pretty big system thinker and builder, like everything, the way I run company, the way I write, the way I coach, there is an SLP. And, they were, and, and I also have an SLP for my life. And they just look at my notion page. They're like, hey, why don't you just like build a system for like, you know, life, living less? And I was like, that's a good name. I'll take that. <laughs> so, and and that, that's just how it came about. But living less now, it started from just like my one-on-one -on -one coaching, one-on-one -on -one way of like coaching founders. And then there's a lot of demands about like, how could I have, Kind of build a community around all the people I already have, like the people I have been serving in the past, the readers, um, all of them. And then the fellowship is basically turning my one-on-one, -on -one, like a la carte coaching, into a really system systematic structured program. It's a group coaching stuff. In six weeks, I will help you from like not knowing what you're doing next and having absolute clarity and carry that out, carry that action out in your life. So that's basically my way of like turning and building all the systems that have helped people, like the pillars, uh, the questions, and the framework that, that has helped me and them into a way to help like tell people at once to find the clarity for the next steps. So that's the fellowship, which is the core product of Living Loss. And then the way it's nonprofit is because there's a lot of like free materials out there, the newsletter, the podcast, like good stuff, right? And those are just trying to serve people who may not know, may, may not be ready to like take action, may not be ready to be in transition. They just want to read and think and brainstorm. And that's the audience we are serving with the newsletter and the podcast. So if I, if I understand that correctly, you've kind of got <clears throat> like a whole, your whole like mini, like living OS mini empires, right? Like the content, <laughs> you know, like the podcast newsletter stuff that you're writing, you have this like fellowship and then you have the coaching and those are like the three pillars of a living so OS. I would, combine, right? I would combine coaching with fellowship. So fellowship is group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching, I out of capacity, I only serve the old clients I have and new ones are all in the fellowship. So the coaching, I would say, is the, is the way I serve the, fellowship, the fellows, but the fellowship is the key product and then the content is the other one. And how did you come up with the, the kind of framework? Like what, what does that kind of look like? If, if I were to be wanting to take that, that uh, Living OS fellowship, what would, what would happen to me? Yeah, Anthony, were you, uh, did you see the office hour in, on that? Uh, yeah, I saw that you, um, the one that you put on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't so, able to attend, unfortunately. Yeah, so that's basically my signature offering. Anyone who sign up for the fellowship 
and, and get an interview will we'll receive that. 20 minutes, I will help you define your core life values um, and help you solve one, one big question you have. So that's the way, uh, that's the system. Usually, I think the thing, okay, not sure, let, let me know if this is okay to say, but for me, I think the biggest struggle with coaching is that since I also have a coach, you don't really know what you're paying for. It's really hard to measure the ROI sure. because yeah. sometimes, does it take six months to solve my problem? Does it take six weeks? Like, you don't know. And I think there's actually a recipe that I crafted by just trials and errors and a bunch of research that can help people get sustainable, like consistent results over time. And that's the, that's the fellowship that I designed. So, and that's why I say in six weeks, I will help you define what you are going to do next in, in the next six months. In, two, in 20 minutes, I will help you find your life value. So those are these things that I kind of crystallized because I hate being ambiguous about what I could offer as a coach. I, I, I kind of say, I love, it's, it sounds like truly like, like, fluffier coaching that has been now taken from the background of someone like you who's like a Google PM, you know, applying that kind of principle <laughs> to the fluffy-ish regular stuff of coaching. Yeah, I think there's the touchy-feely stuff, which is absolutely important, but also I'm not that patient, you know, like I, I don't want to, I'm not a therapist, I'm just a coach trying to help you get better performance in your life. So that's why I want to make sure that there's a system you can easily measure whether I'm effective or not and tell me how I can improve. And that's how I want to build a system for the fellowship. That's really cool. I guess one, one criticism that could arise, and I'm sure you may have had it leveled at you, I'd love to know what you have to think about it, is that, you know, you're, you're incredibly young. Um, yeah. If I'm 40, 50, 60, and I want to be coached, why, why would I come to someone in their 20s who's got, you know, a quarter of my life experience? Yeah, I love that. I love that question so much because I ask my clients every time. Like, I, I got a lot of clients who are a double, triple my age sometimes, and I asked them like, why do you choose me? And why do you switch from your coach to me? And the reason is that they think there's the energy and the system that they couldn't, they haven't seen otherwise. Like they have been in the industry for so long and they haven't used the way coaching has been, right? And I'm basically saying that, hey, like, okay, there's that, but let's try to do things differently. And I'm going to promise you a recipe and help, and help you get there in a time that you couldn't imagine. Like some, some people are stuck just by thinking a problem for six months and in six months I can help you take the action already. So there's that. And then the energy piece is that I think I am an incredibly optimistic person. And that energy usually can help people who are in a silo or like working in the same place for a long time to have a different take. And I think, and I also really like, it's not only like I'm not optimistic, but I'm also, I also truly believe that everyone has the agency to change himself, like, like from, from scratch or like 100, 180 degrees uh, and flip that. So there's that and also the track record of like having been able to do so for like hundreds of founders that also speak, uh, speak to uh, what they are like maybe questioning about, but also having the energy and helping them to see that, hey, 20 minutes, I can help you find your life value. What do you think could happen in an hour, in two hours, in, in succession? And that's how I kind of share the testimonial with them. Yeah, testimony is probably key then. I guess, so what, what are some of the successes? Tell us some, a story, obviously without the names, but tell me a success story. Yeah. So, do you want uh, do you want do you want one from life or career? Can we do both? Uh, let's go for one from each. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's start from career. Um, so this this client, he, how much can I say it? Let me think. Okay. 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 <laughs> this client works in a prominent Silicon Valley tech startup. He is a I would say a friend of friends, and he has. So he's incredibly smart, done a lot of like, you know, competition in his like early 20s. And then 10, 20 years later, he just felt really stuck. He felt like he's not operating at that capacity anymore. He, don't, he doesn't know what is wrong. He is pretty recognized in his current role, but he doesn't know what he could do next. And he's also telling me that coaching, this is not going to work. Like he is a pessimist, like this is not, 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 not a thing for him. And then I just tried to say, okay, so what has happened? Tell me more about the stories to tell yourself. Tell me more about the questions you're grappling. And just by looking at his question, you can see the assumptions, right? He is super critical. Like he overthinks about like what will happen, like X, Y, Z. It's not only second order thinking, it's like 10th order thinking. He'll be like, okay, everything that happens here is going to be us. It's going to be terrible. Like it's always go about, go down to that idea. And then you kind of, I saw a thread that the story he has been telling himself is that he like, it's whatever he does, it's not going to be that important. He's not going to be recognized. And that actually came from his childhood. Cause like he, when he was growing up, his parents, both doctors really busy, 
they don't have time to like tell him that, hey, you're doing a good job. So he has been achieving all his life. Thing, and not only that, he's actually stuck by having that uh, and wanting that recognition. And when I point that out, and he actually go to have that difficult conversation with his parents, that's when things start to turn around. And now he's actually able to, uh, actually, I won't say transition, but okay. So he, now, he's, now he's able to identify what he wants to do next. And, he, and since he has a family, he's helping the entire family to feel, that, to feel like, oh, there's this possibility again. So I think that's the biggest transformation I've seen from the tech leaders uh, in the Valley. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's really profound. Um, I guess yeah. a lot of people are probably pursuing what they want the image of themselves to be more than what they actually want for themselves. Uh, is, this, is that something kind of a pattern that you've seen across a lot of particularly tech founders, I imagine? So I think the number one reason people couldn't love themselves is because they're telling a story that is uh, actually not from themselves. So the voice they are telling themselves with is their, from their parent, their competition, their teacher. It's from someone else who may not have the best interest in them, right? And they have been hearing that story for so long that they have internalized that and using that as an excuse. So the, the way I ask people to like tell excuse from like reality is, if I give you $10 million, can you solve that problem? If you can solve that with $10 million, then you're probably in your bullshit now. Like you can probably find a way to do that and, and get out that scarcity mindset. So yeah, so I, I think this is actually a bonus versus scarcity, like $10 million give you that bonus mindset, but it's a good way to, a thought experiment to get you out of that loophole. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I thought I've done a lot of thinking about the abundance mindset. I think it's, it's such an interesting transition for someone to have to make, right? To go from kind of scarcity of either resources, opportunity, um, love, whatever it might be, to, to go to an abundant mindset of that. So tell us a, tell us a life story. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. So there's this fellow who has been following us for a while. And she's struggling with something in their life that I don't know whether I could solve. I recommend that she see a therapist, but I also kind of think that maybe there's a way that we could make this work. So I share it with my team. My team said, this will be a great moment to see whether we can have any type of these fellows in the future. So we, we, we took a chance. And what ended up happening is that there were a lot of hard emotions that came up, like a lot of hate, a lot of self love a lot of uh, things that are really heavy that I will say, I, can I really do this? And then what ended up changing is that I gave her an emotional inquiry exercise where I help her see why her emotions uh, are shaped up this way. What, what are some of the factors? How could she identify the root cause and really distancing emotion from herself. And that's when we kind of take a hold of the hard, heavy emotion and try to kind of like break it down and try to solve it in a way that's empowering to her. And now after that, like when we said, well, is she really okay? She has become our biggest champion of the fellowship. Like if you have seen our fellowship, you will see that she's sharing her story. She's able to see what she like is lovable and actually start forging a different relationship with her family. Because I think the biggest thing that I've been hearing her stories and she always like write this long, long prose. And I was like, what is going on? And then there's one time I just asked her, so do you love your parents? And she said, no. And I was like, okay, so why, why is that? Why don't you love your parents? And she's like, because they like my sister more. And, and that's when I was like, so how is your relationship with your sister? And she's like, we're roommates. And I was like, anything, anything more? Like your roommates, your sister, they're like, she's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's roommates. And I think that's actually the root cause. Like we've been talking about like, her journal, her emotions, but actually the root cause came from her relationship with her roommate who are living with her for the whole 25, 30 years. So, and that's where we get to uh, get them to uh, the root cause and actually have that difficult conversation and unwrap um, everything that's around her. Hey, that's, that's amazing. Oh. I, there's always one thing that's, that seems worth posing when we're talking about kind of life coaching that I think kind of always sticks out to me is, you know, at what point do you say, I know, I know you mentioned, you know, you should maybe see a psychotherapist uh, or a therapist or whatever it is, you know, at what point does it become not your job? And actually, you know, you have a pastoral responsibility to say, I can't help you with this. Cause I think that seems really important, particularly when we're dealing with, you know, deep rooted childhood emotions, uh, et cetera. Therapist is holding your past, and I think coaching is holding your present and future. So if I found that after one or two sessions, uh, 
everything we have been working is going to be anchored and like she couldn't get out of the past like she couldn't see what's happening in the future I would have to I, I would recommend them to get a therapist before we continue the work because I feel like if we don't heal the past and take you out of that you know like the story you tell yourself for many many decades it's impossible to have you see what's going to happen like the possibilities so usually I haven't met anyone who who couldn't get out of that story though. So I think humans are more resilient than we think, um, including the examples that my, my team didn't think that we could do. I, we were able to get her out in two sessions. So I think uh, usually the second session is a good, is a good um, stepping stone to, to decide whether we could help her keep going with the fellowship or taking a step back to have therapist support. Amazing. Now, could you tell us a bit about the, the book that you're writing and how that came about? Is this support like the whole, living os structure no. or okay no. people talk, people ask that a lot so i have to just like no uh it's it's a surprise <laughs> <Not> like that <laughs> so, <laughs> i started writing that i started writing a family letter to my brother so just like the clients i mentioned Thanks. my brother and i didn't have the best relationship uh we don't talk that much and he really don't reply to my messages so i, I was trying to find a way to tell him you know, this is how American life is like. This is because he's coming to MIT for the second year this year uh, um, and he doesn't know what to expect like me. So I just wanted to tell him that, hey, like in the series called Dear Wire, and I wrote down, this is how like studies, like the life is like. And then even though he didn't reply, many people love that series. And that's how the book came about. Someone pitched me, they're like, hey, do you want to turn this into a book? Because like, it's how many people like your brother. And it was going to call Dear Warren, but then it, I think my publisher called out, they were like, Dear Warren is a good memoir name, but no one knows who Warren is. Like, why, why bother Dear Warren if he doesn't read it? So he changed it to, my publisher changed it to Model Breakers. And they're like, you have been talking about breaking away from a stereotype, breaking away from model minority, but you're just reinforcing the breaking away from model minority, like quote unquote model minority. Why don't you give it a different name? And that's why we changed it to model breakers. Like instead of like just calling model minority, model minority, model minority we're not calling model breakers. So then we have a noun, we have a pronoun to uh, hang on to when we want to know who we are in society. Cause like the truth is that just like me um, in college freshman year, I didn't know who I was. Like it took me a year and a half to recover and I have the chance to rewrite my story again. So if there is, if I could go back in time, meet my freshman self and say, hey, this book is going to help you know more about yourself and your history, which is not being recognized in the society and tell the people uh, and your support network to, to, to like start thinking differently. That's how we, got, we are going to change the social narrative. Cause like, we, it doesn't just take like one person and one blog post to change. It really takes a, a wave of people who are going to say a different story, tell different things and break the stereotype. Cause like usually maybe there's one or two percent of people who are like really offending you but it's actually the 90% who are not speaking out that's harming you the most. Because they're basically buying into the status quo. They're saying that it's fine, don't change. And those are the people who you actually need to change and talk to. So, so tell us about that experience of, you know, what is, what is the stereotype in your eyes? How do you understand it? How do you feel it when you're actually living it? I think I was, if you still couldn't tell, I was an overachiever and I have been that my whole life. And it got really bad around, second to third year of my college. I got a weird disease, like my, my face hurt, but the, the facial uh, nerves hurt a lot, but no doctors could know why. They don't know what's happening. Um, but deep down, I know why. I know it's because of the stress. Like the stress has been just, you know, hammering down onto everything I'm doing. And there's so many critical voices in my head. I just couldn't hold it anymore. And even though the doctors don't know why, I basically just took that two months off to recover. and things got better. So I feel like I'm a doctor Seuss. But anyways, um, that, that process of like knowing that the happiness doesn't come from the outcome, it comes from a process is the, is the main message I want to tell people. Like, yes, like people are saying that, hey, you have to, I will be happy when I got that, when I like become successful, become a doctor, become like X, Y, Z. But if you don't know who you are, no matter who you become, you will still struggle as much as you started. So that is the, 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 one of the key thesis we want to tell people. And the second one is that, okay, now that you know that, how could you start telling a different story, working a different way and maybe empowering your, your peers as well? Because like all the people who struggle to be fully themselves has a reason. Either they were not loved, they don't think they were loved, they 
attach, they outsource their happiness to the outcome, they don't focus on the process. There are so many reasons, but there's actually some key pillar, just like from the coaching I do, I learned and seen that people can change by hammer, uh, anchoring and internalizing these new ideas. That's, That's such a deep rooted really belief in, in the power of someone to change themselves. I, I really, really love that. Um, yeah. And so, so the book itself is, is coming out when? Like give us a- Coming like, out April 30th. Where do we find it? How do we find so, it? So we have passed the pre-launch, which was in December, but now uh, in April 30th on Amazon.com, Burns and Novels, every, everywhere. If you type Model Breaker is, you'll see the book. I think everybody should go buy it for sure. Um, now, Charlene, like uh, related to what those life lessons were, I would love to ask you a question. Like, Knowing what you know now, what would you go tell to your younger self? Let's say maybe Charlie when she was 18, if you could talk to her right now. I think I would focus more. So people say I'm a perfectionist, but I really don't think I'm a perfectionist. And I think it's, uh, when a perfectionist hears that people say they're perfect, because admitting that is not perfect. So, okay, so with that, I think maybe I was a perfectionist <laughs> when I was in, at 18. And that is actually the biggest barrier. I, I, I was self-sabotaging my own progress because I wouldn't be happy until I got the ideal outcome I wanted, right? So I think that really diminishes like that 18, 20, like that two, three years of life because what, is, what matters is not the shiny moments, like the, the because it's a, it, it will end. It doesn't last there forever. What matters is the people around you, the connections you build, like the, the community that's actually surrounding you every day. And really invest in that. I didn't invest in community that early. I didn't care. Uh, I could just couldn't care less. And I would really go back because college time is the best time to foster those connections, right? Mm -hmm. So I would really tell her to just you know enjoy. Don't worry too much about the future. Be kind, be good, and help your people. And I think that's why I coach people now because I want to make up for that lack of connection uh, in my early early twenties. Charlie, we 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 started asking this one last question. And we're going to ask you, what is your favorite rom-com? Oh, oh Emily, <laughs> so Emily in Paris? Emily in Paris? I haven't yeah. seen it, but I've actually wrote about it. But that, is, that, is that your answer? Wait, you haven't seen it, but you wrote about it. Yeah, that, I, I saw Tony in Paris, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, wrote, I wrote an article inspired by the concept. <laughs> um, this is yeah. exactly the journaling I mentioned. Like, you just read the book, you don't read the book, but you journal it. That's yeah. exactly it. Yeah, so you know, we're on the same page here. Um, wait, so is, is Emily in Paris, that is your favorite romantic comedy? Um, if friends, oh, the, number one, I don't watch videos. Like I, I never watch it about Netflix or YouTube. I only watch Nef Emily in Paris because I was like in the dentist chair trying to find something on his Netflix. That's the only reason I watch it. That's the only rom kind I watch in 2020. So yeah. that, that's an important, <laughs> yeah, preface. <Yeah. laughs> uh, any films, like maybe from, from uh, like any favorite films that are romantic comedies? Just, just curious. Hey, I think, I think no. Let's go for the book. Okay, like, we could do, we could do Love Emily in Paris. Yeah. Final answer. I don't, I don't watch films. <laughs> oh, that's great. Love the book. Yeah, I, I was, I, I'll have to send you like fifty film recommendations after this, by the way. And maybe you won't watch it Thank anytime you. soon, but I've got some that will change your life. I can guarantee that. Yeah, yeah, love that. The ones that you've watched lately. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've got such a big list of any. I actually, at one point, when I was younger. I wanted to be a film major, but didn't do it. But there's, wow. there's a lot of, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, but yeah, thank you, Charlene. It's been yeah, wonderful talking to you. I learned a lot. I feel like there's a lot of things that you've done that are just very helpful for how people can approach life. 